This podcast should not be used as a substitute for medical or mental health advice. Individuals are advised to seek independent medical advice, counseling, and or therapy from a healthcare professional with respect to any medical condition, mental health issue, or health inquiry, including matters discussed on this podcast. This episode discusses abuse, which may be triggering to some people. The views and opinions expressed are solely those of the podcast author or individuals participating in the podcast and do not represent the opinions of Red Table Talk Productions, iHeartMedia, or their employees. Think about the one person you love the most, your best memory of love and friendship. Now, somebody comes to tell you that the person you love is a sociopath. Now feel that resistance. Now you have evidence that proves this person is a sociopath. Someone you love and you thought cared about you is a monster. Try on what that feels like. In part one of our interview, Mark shared with us how he became part of the Nexium organization, which was slowly revealed to be a cult-like and ultimately an abusive organization run by mastermind Keith Raniere. Mark has shared with us his own vulnerabilities that put him at risk for Raniere's manipulation, the process of indoctrination into this group, and the gradual erosion of his sense of self. Mark's description of Nexium is consistent with the architecture of any narcissistic relationship. The love bombing, the devaluing, the smear campaigns, triangulation, and ultimately the betrayal. The narcissistic patterns Mark observed were a mashup of a more covert, vulnerable, and communal styles of narcissism. Mark's wife, Bonnie, initially shared with him her suspicions that Ranieri's behavior may be narcissistic. And once he learned that, the pieces started to fall into place. But at the same time, the scandal that was Nexium slowly started to show itself. And Mark will now share the experience of watching the horror of the harm caused by a narcissistic cult leader, his enablers, and the challenges of trying to tackle it head on without losing himself. Next, I'd like to talk about Bonnie, who you know, I've not met Bonnie. I cannot wait because I'll tell you, I have such admiration for her because she's that unicorn who sensed it and saw it. And if we had a world full of Bonnies, there would be no Keiths because she sensed it and she sort of shut it down for herself. But I really think that the other wonderful thing about your wife, Bonnie, is that she didn't hit you over the head with that either. She slowly gave you the information and let you come to it. I really preach to everyone, be a Bonnie. Don't go up to someone and say, your husband is a narcissist, but kind of gently push the article across the table and see how that works out. So I'm a huge Bonnie fan. So I'm tell us about too. Bonnie. Yeah, go ahead. Look, tell I us think, about I her. I think one of the most powerful things about her is her intuition, which was taken offline for a while. Yeah, yeah, I'm sure. But they couldn't do it enough. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And I think what happened eventually is things got so bad because being somebody who's deeply empathic, I think what happens is people like Bonnie feel things in their body a lot, Mm -hmm. very powerfully and early Mm -hmm. before they're able to figure out what's actually going on in the situation intellectually, they feel it in their body. So she was feeling something in her body. And I think what happened eventually, I think in 2016, she said... I have so many things going on. I have all these fears. I'm just going to sit down and be still with myself. And she spent about 10 days just being utterly still on her own. She just went on retreat. And she, I guess, found some kind of connection that allowed her to see how the entire system was working. Hmm. And she saw all the coercion and all the fear and all the guilt and all the punishment. And shortly after that, she took a walk with Ranieri and said to him, you know what I see? I see all of these things. And of course... Wow. None of us knew who he was at that point. And he said to her something like, it seems like if you complain a lot, the squeaky wheel gets the oil, gets the grease. Is this maybe just you trying to get attention kind of thing? Oh. And in her mind, she was like, all right, I see what we're dealing with. Good for her. And that's when she knew, okay, this guy is not a good guy. She was able to do that, though. She didn't fall for the it's you sort of thing. Instead of saying, maybe it's me, she went with this guy's not a good guy. got connected to herself. Wow. I think she's you know, spending those 10 days on her own. 
she got connected to herself in a way that most people don't have time in a cult. Right, right. Because they keep you exhausted. They keep you busy. And I was off shooting a film in Mexico and she said to me, I'm going to LA. I'm just going to go and like, just go into retreat. Mm -hmm, So she mm -hmm. took the time to connect to herself. And what happens when you get away from all that noise Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. is you start to find yourself. Mm -hmm, And she mm -hmm, did. mm -hmm. And then she became unstoppable. And look, we all made mistakes. I made a bunch of mistakes waking people up, trying, you know, too hard, being too brash. At first, she also pushed too hard. No, she did. Okay. And then what happened is she spoke to this amazing exit counselor who said, you can't do that. Yeah. You have to figure out exactly what the minefields are. Yep. So she was very smart in how she did it. And by the time that the dam broke for me, I was able to talk to the exit yeah. counselor as well, you know. And this person was amazing. She was incredible. That's great. I mean, one of the first things she said to me, she said, do you have dirt on them? And I go, probably. She said, you're going to need it. Mm-hmm. And that's mm-hmm. when I really understood, oh, my friends are going to come after me. Yes. They're yes. going to destroy my life mm-hmm. and my family. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. You know, people say, oh, it was very brave what you guys did. And to some degree, yes. But there's something amazing when you get forced against a wall and you don't have a choice anymore, it's amazing what you'll do. Some people, many people. I would still argue it's brave. We're sitting here basking in the wake of it being resolved. Well, it's not resolved, Mark, and you are firing into the unknown, and you know what these folks are capable of, it is tremendously courageous. And many people, even though they may know the right thing to do, they're too scared. In other stories, there may be minor children involved. You don't know what stops people. I'm not saying it's necessarily a lack of courage, but Uh when it's not known, it's one thing to sort of survey the damage after a hurricane, but you go to a dark place in the middle of a Category 5 hurricane. Do you know what this is? This is me still doing some of the old patterns. Yeah, yeah. Underplaying things. Yeah, Mm -hmm. no, no. As opposed to celebrating things. And you don't even need to have to celebrate it, but you don't get to underplay it. It's to see it realistically, Mm. right? It's that gray of that was brave. I I can't even sit here and confidently tell you I would have been able to, or I would have, and I would have, it would have wrecked me because it is so terrifying when you don't know what's going to happen. It's the Mm. not knowing. If you felt confident, we're going to do this and it's all going to be fine. But with the not knowing, it's, that's terrifying. It was terrible. And I think that what happened is when I realized what he had done to my friends, mm-hmm, mm-hmm, my female mm-hmm. friends, that's when the rage mm-hmm, began. Mm-hmm. And that rage lasted a long yeah. time. Yeah. And I think that sometimes it does take someone else. The, the, you might not even have fought this fight if it was just you. But the harms that were coming to other people in such a systematic way, I think that rallied you and that speaks to something about you. Maybe that's your goodness saying, there can't be this erosion of goodness in no. the world. I got to go in there. No. So talk to me about how you met Bonnie. Bonnie and I met actually, I think it was 2000 and... The first time, I think it was around 2006, maybe. Mm -hmm. I actually was trying to enroll her in Mm. in, in Ixium. And we stayed in touch over the years. And I think we reconnected in about 2009. Mm -hmm. We went to have tea. And she said to me, something's really different about you. And she, as she was at a time in her life, she was thinking, well, things are not working for me so well. Let me see what you have to offer. So she came to take an intensive and she liked it. Mm -hmm. She really enjoyed it. She got a lot out of it. What happened, though, is our friendship grew more and more. And look, the reason that I met Bonnie in the first place is I was a huge Star Wars fan. Mm -hmm, And so mm -hmm. she she being an actress in Star Wars, a mutual friend of ours introduced us. And she was a huge fan of What the Bleep. So that's how we first met. Oh, okay, got it. I've told a few people the story. We went out to dinner one night to watch a show and to have some dinner. And I'd never heard her music because she was she's a singer. Mm-hmm. And I said, do you have anything? Do you have your music? She said, no, but do you have a guitar? And I said, actually, I do. I was staying with a friend up in the Hollywood Hills, went up in the hills. I made her some tea. She began playing guitar and singing to me, and it was all over. Oh. It was the most beautiful sound I'd oh. ever heard in my life. And that was the moment I realized I'm screwed. <laughs> <laughs> it is all over. And we have been incredibly bonded, you know, Mm -hmm, all these mm -hmm, years. mm -hmm. And we've been through so much. And honestly, it has made us stronger and stronger. Yeah. I think that she, and many people have told me this, her demonstration of true love that is seen in the vow is what fortifies me. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You know, her goodness, her kindness, and her fierceness. Right. This is not a pushover. Mm -hmm. My wife is not a pushover. No, 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 no. She is fierce. Yes. And you know, one thing that does tell me though, is that you had and sustained a love story simultaneously to going through what you went through in Nexium. She also had her own experience with it too, but it's a reminder to everyone too, that if 
when people are going through narcissistic abuse, if there's even one empathic, loving touchstone in your life, that might be one of the most single most important tools towards getting out, towards healing. Not everyone has that. But if you have one, and in your case, it was a spouse, a partner, other people, it's a dear friend, others, it may be a sibling or a family member, whatever that looks like. But it is a, it's a game changer to have that. And what's remarkable is you came through this together, a real reminder that it doesn't always have to be scorched earth. It's simultaneously to being in this horribly narcissistically abusive system, you were able to have and do still have a real loving relationship. And I think that is probably to me one of the most important parts of your story, Mark, because so many people think I'm going through this narcissistically abusive situation. I'm never going to love or be loved again. That didn't go away for you. And I think to anyone listening to know that even when you are being harmed and destroyed by a narcissistic person, you remain cherishable and lovable. Absolutely. Absolutely. I was also fortunate because I knew what actual love was. Yes. That that, yes. that was a, yes. a touchstone, mm-hmm. a comparison mm-hmm. all the time because mm-hmm. in, in next team they would talk about love and I'd be like, I don't know if that's what love is. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. They'd say things like, well, you know, love is your ability to withstand pain. That's true love. And I go, mm-hmm. okay, yes, I can, yes, to some degree, but like, the shit you're talking about does not feel good. Yeah, no. And mm. the thing that I have actually feels amazing, but they yeah. try to make that seem like a weakness. Correct. They try to make Correct. that seem like an attachment yeah. Yeah. that you had mm-hmm. that you needed mm-hmm. to get rid of. They were constantly trying to separate people. And that love pain thing, I'm I'm not getting down with that thing. That no, that that's just no. intellectually. Mm-hmm. There's certain things, you know. If you love a child, are you willing mm-hmm. to go through enormous pain for your child? Yes. Mm-hmm. But let's not make that a blanket statement and apply mm-hmm. that to everything and say mm-hmm. love is that. Right. That right. is an aspect of love, perhaps. Yes. yes, exactly. I think though that spinning it in, this is almost like when people are told relationships are hard, marriages are work. So that way when it, it feels really awful, yeah. people, oh, this is supposed to feel like yes. this, and they keep fighting for it. All of these experiences you were having, they were being equated with pain and any questioning from you was viewed as weakness. Yeah. They also said in the, the intensives, if you're feeling uncomfortable, it's working. Right, right. Yeah, no. That is a mm-hmm. very slippery, evil slope. Yes, it is. It's a very slippery slope. Okay, so Keith Raniere was the focus of these stories. Nancy, a little secondarily, but you know, Keith Raniere was sort of positioned as the leader, the villain, rightfully so. But he could not have done this alone. Talk to me about the other players in this story that supported, I may even continue to be supporting yeah, him and what he's doing. Yeah. See, the thing is, there's this king, right? And around him were all these people that were constantly talking him up. Yeah. When I first got there, I remember meeting all these people around him, mostly women, who would talk about him in such glowing terms. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And you start to believe the sort of myth after a while. So maybe he is these things. Maybe he is these things. I was a bit confused as well because they seemed to be in love with him as well. It was, mm. it was a bit odd. But I was like, okay, well, I can get on board with maybe this guy is a really good guy. I never would have believed that he was who I eventually believed he was if it wasn't for the people around him. Mm. Interesting. The advertising campaign was constant. Yep. Constant. Nancy Salzman looked like she would die for him. Wow. Nancy Salzman was the co-founder of Nexium with Ranieri. She was actually trained as a nurse and worked with Ranieri developing a company called Executive Success Programs, which was the forerunner of Nexium. She was sort of the second in command in Nexium and in true culty fashion was given the title of prefect. Salzman was the embodiment of the enabler and would go to great lengths including surveillance of cult members to shut down critics and aid and abet Ranieri. And if I ever said anything about him or somebody else said anything about him negative, she would go after you like it was nobody's business. Mm. She would crush you. It was vengeful at times what would happen. So you're hearing the advertising campaign and you also know there's a cost if you question things. Mm -hmm. And the people like her and a few other people, some that have now died, They were his enablers. Mm -hmm. They were Mm -hmm. sort of, you know, the people that spoke constantly about him. Now, the thing is, everybody began doing that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We all began doing that because that was what was required. That was what is expected. In fact, if you didn't do it enough, 
you were told that you have a problem with tribute. Mm, you know, if you can't give tribute to other people for their achievements, it means you don't understand what achievement is. Mm, mm-hmm, you don't understand mm-hmm. what it means to be a producer mm-hmm. of value. Mm-hmm. So I noticed that the way you spoke about Keith, you didn't really give him tribute for these things here. And I said, I gave him tribute for this and this. Yeah, but what about these things here? Mm-hmm. Perhaps you need to retake the tribute module right. to understand what your limitation is. So what happened is you were admonished if you didn't praise enough. Right. Which is right. like an authoritarian yes, system. Yes, that's exactly right. You know, right. it's like the authoritarian right. king that you weren't like commenting on the clothing that wasn't there enough. Or the narcissistic parent. Or the narcissistic parent, yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. Mm-hmm. So the truth is everybody became that. Yeah, yeah. But there were people, and some of them are still loyal to him. They, it looks like they will die for him. Yes. And they yeah. will do anything for him. Mm-hmm. So I think it's important for people to see that, that there's a spectrum here, that there are some people who don't break out of the trauma-bonded cycle. And that unwillingness to identify it, that's beyond the scope of what we can talk about here. But I do think that's a, it's a critically important piece that people know that not everyone has the same outcome. You came out of it, and part yeah. of that was your focus, I think, on on goodness and growth and creativity, and you were loved. Yeah, and are exactly. loved. My session with Mark will continue after this break. In any kind of a narcissistic system, whether it is a cult a company, or even a family. When there is someone demanding obedience and admiration for the dominator, the leader, and the narcissist in charge, it's as though everyone is being pulled into the vortex of that mega enabler's trauma bond. This kind of dominating and harmful enabler gives the narcissist exponentially more power and protection. Think about the one person you love the most, your best memory of love and friendship. Now, somebody comes to tell you that the person you love is a sociopath. Now feel that resistance. Now you have evidence that proves this person is a sociopath. Someone you love and you thought cared about you is a monster. Try on what that feels like. This statement bowled me over because I think that so many of us, so many people hearing this will say, oh, well, like really, co-leader, how could you have thought well of him? But even people in narcissistic relationships, right, that there is that day, and it's not a day, it builds up to a day, but maybe it is that day you read the article and you have the conversation or you watch the video and say, oh my gosh, this is beginning to add up. And then that's the day that you find out that this person you love is a sociopath or a psychopath or a narcissist. And there's that day you have, like you said, try on what that feels like. Mm. It is so important for everyone listening to this to do that. Because one of the things I struggled with most when I watched The Vow, when I've anything I've listened to or read about with it, was the amount of finger pointing. What is wrong with these people who couldn't see this, who signed up for the sex cult, which is not what happened, No. but the blaming there. And then almost the more salacious interest in what was happening rather than, I want to say, slow down, everyone. You're all doing this. You just happen to be doing it in your own homes. But the humanization that you did here is like, just take a minute, slow down, think about someone you love. Now you find out they're this. Yeah. And just sit with that for a minute. Yeah. That is a moment every single person goes through when they're in these situations. Mm-hmm. The reason I did that was because I feel that everybody who looks at these things is coming from having the knowledge already of what's going on. Mm-hmm. And that's, as you said, not what's going on. Mm-hmm. What's going on is you're entranced in some kind of way. Yes. Be it a romantic partner, be it a, a priest, a cult leader, the CEO of an organization, a political leader, mm-hmm. president, whatever. Mm-hmm. You don't know any of this stuff yet. Mm-mm. And I wanted people to really try on what it Mm -hmm. feels like, Mm -hmm. that moment of shock. When somebody tells you who they are and you're like, no, Mm -hmm. you like you refuse. It's resistance, but sometimes it's rageful resistance. And then what happens when you take it in? It is a massive shock to the system. But what I'm trying to do all the time is get people to understand, put yourself in the position. Like when people say to me, they say this online a lot still sometimes, like how could you? Mm -hmm. Like how did you not see it? Sometimes I say to them, 
Are you asking because you're ridiculing or you really want to know? Because if you really want to know, here's a bunch of books for you to read. Sure. Yeah. And put yourself in the position mm-hmm. of somebody, it doesn't have to be me, mm-hmm. who's been hoodwinked and learn about it. But don't come to me with these bullshit accusations. That's right. And you said something before. And I tell people the single most disrespectful question we can ask someone, for example, who is a survivor of domestic abuse is, why didn't you leave? When people say that, I see red. I have to step out of a room. I, are you kidding me? Do you not know anything about this? And so it's the same thing here. Why didn't you leave? How about we ask, why did they do that? You want to ask yes. a question, let's ask the right question. Yes. When people say that, mm-hmm. they are literally enabling the abuser. Yes, they are. Because you now yes, have secondary abuse going on. Yep, yes, you do. Because already you come out of these situations mm-hmm. thinking, at first you're like, I'm an idiot. I'm an idiot. Yes. Yeah. And then they say, yes, you're an idiot. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Wow, thank you. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Why don't we talk about mm-hmm. the pathology of the person right. who, by the way, has trained their entire life to abuse people? And me and people mm-hmm. like me and people like yourself didn't train how to destroy people. No, most of us did not. No, we have no right. training as psychopaths. Right. right, and the psychopaths probably a little bit more born that way. Narcissistic um, people kind of get that way. But I will say this, that the way these stories get told, the vow is one of many where the story is told this way. You know this better than, and far better than I do as a filmmaker. It's all about where you train the lens. And there are times, and I remember the scene of the vow very well, all of you were sort of at a summer camp kind of a setup and having fun and playing and acting like children. There's a blamey thing that went along with that. Like, oh, you fools carrying on like kids. I'm thinking, oh, gosh, they're having such a fun time. Good for them, you know? Mm-hmm. But there is that that entire sense of these are children. These are fools. They're playing. And I think I find it so interesting that we live in a culture that pathologizes joy. Yes. Because as soon as you pathologize joy, you really do give the power to the joyless. Yes. And the joyless are getting more and more power. Because really, I think that's something we are lacking is just sort of... If people watch The Vow, they would have that sense of the story of going from what started out as these sort of personal development seminars, it was ESP, ESP, and that then, you know, evolved into this larger organization of Nexium, and then devolved into these sorts of sub-factions where the abuse was really happening. And you had a story going on while all of that story was going on. What was it like? How did that all evolve from a first-person perspective as this whole situation was unbraiding? You went in for personal development. And obviously, I will say, even the personal development piece had some of the markers of organizations that should concern us, levels and the sashes and calling him Vanguard and changing identities. All of that is cultic structure because it's taking one away from identity. It's creating artificial hierarchies, leveling up and all of that. But even all of that, that then this next devolution really into this sort of grooming, sexually abusive element of this, how did that unfold? Was that happening in parallel, in tandem? Did it evolve down the road? And what was it like to be in the presence of all of that? There's the surface level of everything, which is personal growth, creating centers, creating business paths, that kind of thing. And then people that were closer to Ranieri seemed to be on some kind of other path, which didn't make a lot of sense mm-hmm. to me at first, but he had a lot of people close to him. I think that a lot of this was going on from the very beginning. Mm-hmm. What turned out to be DOS, the sort of what the world sees as some mm-hmm. sex slave club, that had been going on for a long time. Mm-hmm. He had been, I found out later, that back in 2005, mm-hmm. he had been talking about creating a sort of a blackmail club of women that would target certain powerful men Mm -hmm. and try and get Mm -hmm. blackmail material from Mm -hmm. them. So he was thinking about that stuff for a long time. It turns out later we all realized he was also sleeping with all these people, Mm -hmm. which Mm -hmm. we didn't know for a long time. That That became apparent around 2015, 2016. I thought, finally I was thinking, oh, so he's not a renunciate, so he is having relationships? Mm -hmm. That's Mm -hmm. new to me and was new to a lot of people. Uh, okay. So, yes, it was happening in parallel, but just imagine the CIA or the NSA, everything's a need-to-know basis. Yep. And if you ask certain questions, you were shut down. Mm. So there was so much compartmentalization. Like, I remember saying, everybody's whispering. Hmm. And Bonnie and I would talk about it. Everybody's whispering in corners. All these people are whispering. And we had a joke because the guys weren't whispering, but all the women were whispering. Now I realize what was going on. Yeah. They mm-hmm. were all stooping him and having issues about it. Mm-hmm. I didn't mm-hmm. understand that was going mm-hmm. on. 
So you didn't know what you were looking at. You just knew something weird was going on. What happened is that the woman's curriculum and then the men's curriculum and then the ethicist curriculum, that's when stuff started getting really weird. Okay. When the penance stuff started coming in. Yes. When yes. love is pain and pain mm-hmm. is love started coming in. Mm-hmm. And sacrifice is the highest principle. Mm-hmm. Giving of your life is the highest principle. And showing you videos of that monk that burns himself, some self-emulation yes. kind of thing. That was seen as a very noble thing to do, to die for a principle. Wow. was the most powerful thing you could do. Now we were heading into these weird religious yeah. odd places that was devaluing just a good life mm-hmm, mm-hmm. as somehow not being a good thing. That right. you had to reach for the stars and you know, the, apparently he was the highest principle in human form that you had to protect. Wow. All of that was this multi-pronged on-ramp yeah, yeah, yeah. to what became DOS where people had been so hollowed out Mm -hmm. that they thought they bought the idea that slavery is freedom, Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. which is terrifying. It's terrifying, yeah. And it's doublespeak and Mm doublethink, and it's Mm -hmm. a whole bunch of weird Mm -hmm. things. But they bought in because it, it took a while. This is a guy, this is, Ranieri was a salesman for a while. Yes, yeah, I heard he a, a pyramid, like a pyramid scheme, yeah, yeah. multi-level marketing. Yeah. But he also said, you don't get somebody from the first step to the 10th step. You have to get yeah. them to step two and it's get grooming. them to step three. And it's all grooming. And his whole sales technique was about basically grooming somebody to buy the training eventually yeah. and come to yeah. the training. What we didn't realize, though, is everything was about, in essence, the men were devalued, but the women were devalued in a different way. Hmm. Men were devalued to the point that we felt so inadequate and so weak and so, you know, a whole bunch of things. And women were as well, but then women were told, your salvation is completely subjugating yourself yeah. so I can recreate yeah, you yeah, 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 yeah. the mm-hmm, way I want. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Now, he didn't sell it the way I want. He said sure. into something that you should be. Right, right. You know, he mm-hmm. was he was basically talking to Alison Mack about Joan of Arc mm-hmm, mm-hmm. and getting her obsessed with Joan mm-hmm, of Arc. Mm-hmm. You know, there were all these books he was having them all read. Mm -hmm. So I know people rag on these women for making those decisions, but they don't understand how grooming works. Right, right. No, no, they don't. It it is. It's it's a slow burn. These women should not be looked at as as fools. They're not. No, no. Nobody, Nobody who's groomed is a fool. It is a very stepwise process. And when you're pulled away from your ordinary supports... Because that's how grooming works. It's also through isolation. So there's no sounding board. There's no eyes on you to keep look at them. We think classically of grooming. It's a younger person, a child, adolescent, middle school, puberty, who doesn't have a parent who may necessarily, or an adult who is either distracted or not available or just has neglected them and is not paying attention. And then that that's the child who becomes the mark for right. the groomer. It right. is. I think it's something that any of us any of us are vulnerable. It's, it's, that's why grooming works yeah. because it's sort of universally possible for anyone to be taken in. So no, it was a very systematic yeah. process and you saw other women doing it, yes. which normalized it. Yes, championing it, mm-hmm. which was very confusing. One of the things I would say to people is if you see something like that going on and somebody says to you, it's none of your business, make it your business. Make it, I couldn't agree Do, more. I will never mm-hmm. again let somebody mm-hmm. say to me, it's none of my business. Mm-hmm. I'm going to mm-hmm. make it my business. Mm-hmm. Because mm-hmm. I don't like what's going on. That's right. Whatever it is, even mm-hmm. if I don't know what it is mm-hmm. yet. Yeah. Because if I see, for instance, I've walked into restaurants, I've walked into shops where the entire staff looks broken. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And I I've agree. always yeah. said to myself, mm-hmm. a narcissist is running this place. Yes. Yep. These people are broken, they're hollowed out, they're mm-hmm. terrified, they're lifeless. Yep. Yep. Something is not right. I agree. I, I've talked with people who you could see there's a wide-eyed, unsettled, almost skittish nature to them. And yeah. something's not right. And even if you, it's hard because in some of those situations, we go into these restaurants and try to converse with them and we want to blink twice if you want us to arrest yeah. your boss. I don't yeah. know what to tell someone, but yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. But, you know, just picking up on that point, it's really important to, I love what you're doing and, and, and also this, this film I'm working on now, uh, trying so hard to look at the pattern. Yes, yes. Because mm-hmm. you can walk into a restaurant, if you understand the pattern, yep. you can see it. Yeah. And that's the issue with, you know, sort of cult porn or stories about narcissist porn, if you get too lost in the story and the personalities, Mm -hmm. you won't see the pattern. Yes, yes. I'm so glad you brought that up because I, and you and I have talked about this ourselves, this idea that, again, I call it narcissism porn. I agree that there's cult porn, this idea that we are so compelled by the stories of the 
Keith Raniere's and the and all the people who are at the center of these either docu series or even fictionalized series who are so in your face narcissistic that we are almost frozen in that story. In fact, Pete Walker, who is a trauma therapist, calls it fawning. It's a fawning response. It's literally a sympathetic nervous system response we have to someone that dominant, and it reflects an attempt to get attachment needs met when we had such a dominating, invalidating parent in childhood. But you almost find yourself ooing and eyeing and look what they're doing and they're so visionary. And you want to say, slow down, folks. I had Today I had a woman ask me about healthy narcissism. I said, that's like a safe cigarette. No, the two no, words don't get no, to go together. No. And so this desire to think that there can be this impresario that is somehow a benevolent force, it doesn't exist. And we are in a period though, Every other show out there, either everybody on the program is narcissistic or the vast majority or the entire storyline coalesces around a very yeah. narcissistic individual. And I think that this has become, like you said, we've now, we're focusing too much on the narcissistic people yeah. and we're never giving heed to the story of the people who are harmed. And when we do, we portray them as fools. Exactly. Exactly. And you know, our society right now, we enable these people. Oh, 100%. We're putting them in movies. We're putting yeah. them in TV shows. It's like we we worship them. Yes, we do. It's okay to say, look, these people are like doing bad things, but we may have to take a look at ourselves mm -hmm. as well as society because we are really co-contributing to oh, this yes, problem. Oh, yes, we are. Uh, absolutely. In every possible medium you can think of, we are contributing from elections to who holds corporate positions, to who holds the greatest strength in social media, to reality television. You pick a medium, pick a medium. They have the platforms, they have the stages, and we stop what we're doing and we listen and we are normalizing this behavior to global, literally yeah. global detriment. We will be right back with this conversation with Mark. I will say I am worried because I can't fix the world. I'm trying to help people at the individual level. You said something, making it about patterns. If Bonnie had rolled up to you that day and said, Mark, he's a sociopath, he's a narcissist, your eyes might have glazed over a little. Yes. She approached you subtly. There's some patterns here that concern me. Every client I work with say, you've raised some patterns here that are concerning me. The empathy is a little patchy and entitlement. And how does all that make you feel? And then what it is, it's almost like I've laid out all the ingredients mm -hmm. for a soup. Yeah. And they look at that carrot and the potato and the broth. And I'm like, oh, we're making a soup. I'm like, let's talk about this soup, shall we? Because yeah. it's all these things are always exactly. going to make soup. And so I do believe that by talking about this in terms of patterns, Pattern, you don't get as much of the pushback. And I will say also, and it's a misnomer, a lot of people say, oh, you shouldn't say someone's narcissistic. You shouldn't diagnose them. It's not a diagnosis. It's not a diagnosis. If somebody came up to me and I use this example all the time and said, hey, I want you to meet my friend. She's really agreeable. I wouldn't say, oh, don't say that's very diagnostic. It's right. a type of personality yeah. style. And so is being stubborn and so is being introverted and nobody calls that stuff no. diagnostic. This word, and I think it's because the people who are the powers that be don't like the word. It feels mm -hmm. like a bad word because it kind of isn't a very nice word because it's a no. bad pattern. But the world of mental health is silencing this conversation. I have to say, I think they're complicit in it. And they being the world of mental health of saying, maybe we just need to look in their backstory. I said, I don't need to see any backstory when somebody is doing this to another person. All I need to see is the front story that I'm looking yeah. at right no, now. I think that there are some people that are so busy being academic yes. that they've lost their moral compass. Yes, and this is a question mm -hmm. of morality. Mm -hmm. If mm -hmm. somebody's doing bad shit, they're doing bad shit. I agree. They may have a pathology. We yep. can look into that. Right. But there's a problem. But they're going to consistently do bad things. That's the other thing we need to remember is everyone personally Analyzes it. Maybe it's something about me. Maybe I'm bringing out the worst of this person. Maybe I'm not worthy of this. Maybe they're so much smarter than me that I can't keep up. And I don't know in what world smart is a virtue. Smart is like being able to juggle. It's just a skill set. And so that idea of it, it is plausible that it's not them, it's me, also really adds to this. And also something that I know you've brought up and you and I discussed once, the Pollyanna attitude oh. of refusing to see bad things in the world. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The toxic positivity. Mm -hmm. It mm -hmm. is so damaging to mm -hmm. people that are being abused mm -hmm. and it allows these people to yep. sort of skim under the radar. Yep. 
Yep. The spiritual communities, loosely organized in many ways, bank on that. And if a person, for example, isn't experiencing growth, even in seminars like you were in, they will say, well, it's because you aren't trying hard mm. enough. You're not manifesting hard enough. You're not present enough. This is you, not your insane curriculum. And so I think that movement and every other you know, Instagram posts is like this pseudo toxic positivity message. So when a person who's struggling isn't leaning into that positivity and is experiencing real hurt, they pathologize themselves saying, well, maybe this is my fault for not being able to harness my positivity. And I'll say, slow down, sister, you're going to get there, but you need to heal first. So let's think of this in terms of aftermath. I mean, this was devastating. We saw the central players in the vow, like yourself and Sarah's husband, Nippy, but so many people were affected by this, by Nexium, and women harmed and traumatized and all of that. Yeah. So let's talk about this aftermath. Mm -hmm. Let's start by talking about what ended up happening to Keith. I mean, after the six weeks trial, it was extraordinary because the jury came with guilty in all counts, mm. which was amazing. That is amazing. And then Judge Garifus gave him 120 years in prison, which was Unheard of. 120 years. I will never forget the day I read that in the news. I was sitting in my living room and I sat down and I got tears in my eyes and I said, finally, out of 100, 500, 1,000 of these cases, one of these cases was finally sentenced yeah. properly. And that case is now being used as precedent for a yeah. lot of other cases. Yeah, yeah. They were clever in their use of racketeering. Yeah. That was some, something similar. And they, they stayed away and, yeah. from the word cult. They yeah. talked about yeah. courts of psychology mm -hmm. and stuff like mm -hmm. that. They stayed away from cult altogether because yep. it's a very murky topic mm -hmm. in courts. But yeah, racketeering, yep. that's what it was. Yep. It was mm -hmm. the mob, basically. Yep. yep. But using racketeering statutes, focusing, obviously, things that were very clearly happening, the sexual trafficking, the sexual abuse, all of it. I was stunned by the sentence. And it was one of those rare times where you actually felt that there was justice in one of these stories because there so rarely is. Yeah. And much more importantly is to the degree you know what has happened to the other people involved who are yeah. hurt by this. I think it's been very painful to a lot of people. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, there are people that never said a word and just are trying to get their lives back. Yeah. I'm certainly in touch with some of them. And then there's the people that are still loyal. Yeah. And, and, I have finally given up trying to help in mm -hmm, any way mm -hmm. because I can't. Mm -mm. But I don't know I don't know what's going to happen. Yeah. Yeah. And and maybe they won't wake up and maybe mm -mm. it's okay if they don't wake up because waking up might be really Yeah. might be really bad. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. I don't know. I just it's a place. I mean I I have compassion for them. Mhm. Mm but I think they're super lost. They're very lost. And as we said, that there's a continuum of outcome for people in narcissistic relationships and in, in narcissistic organizations, yeah. such as cult-like organizations. Yeah. And not every story ends up right side up. And unfortunately, we trauma bonding, coercive control. These things are very real. And the fact that there are still, I mean, it sounds like 50, 60, 70 people who are still standing behind him and we don't hear much from them. But I imagine for their families, that feels like a loss. Oh, they're trying to talk them. out, but they're not getting a lot of attention. They're not getting they're a lot of on attention, Twitter right. constantly. Oh, interesting. They're okay. constantly saying things about the whistleblowers and talking about how we're just a bunch of victims and, you know, yada, yada, yada. Interesting. So they're forever going to do his bidding and they derive identity yeah. from all of that. But it's a, there's a continuum of outcome here from people yeah. who actually come out and not only whistleblowers, but are able to see a different future and yeah. a different path. And those who don't get out. And I will say to anybody who's contemplating speaking out, it is, I know the most terrifying thing, but it's the most rewarding thing. Because like with any noble battle, you look back and you go, I am so happy I made these choices. Yeah, I'm yeah. so happy mm -hmm, I did these mm -hmm. things. I couldn't imagine looking back and thinking to myself, what if I just said nothing? Yeah, yeah. I couldn't yeah. Mm -hmm. live with myself. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of, there's a lot of wonderful things that comes out of doing the right thing. Absolutely. As Absolutely. terrifying as it is. Yes, I think so. Like I said, here we get the closure of Keith got 120 years. But Mark, there must have been time in there for all of you thinking, this guy may not see a I minute I was terrified the whole time. I was terrified the whole time. I was constantly worried, is the jury going to get it? Right. I was worried about what the defense was doing. I was worried that the prosecutor's going to be able to make their case. When he finally got sentenced guilty in all counts, that was the first time that I was like, all right, we can close this door. But I remember even that, I walked out of the courthouse and I was immediately on camera. And somebody said to me, how do you feel? As though I would feel triumphant. And I said, 
I just feel like there's bodies everywhere. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Because the fallout. Yeah. The, yeah. The damage mm-hmm. to people, mm-hmm. lifelong damage to people. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So profound. It wasn't so much, yay, the bad man's got put away. Mm-hmm. It wasn't that. It was, yes, you can't hurt people in the right. same way anymore. But there's so many people mm-hmm. that got hurt by this. Mm-hmm. And there are people that are upset that we spoke out. Yeah. They feel hurt by us. Mm-hmm. Even people who don't support him. No, they don't still. support him, but they think that there was some better way. They think we should have, there are some people that think we should have met with him. Oh, wow. Discussed things with him. So they don't get it. They, they don't understand. Don't get it. They don't understand. And I would say to them, you don't understand mm-hmm. what we're dealing with here. So speaking out wasn't easy, Mark. So you no, still, horrible, I mean, to this horrible. day, granted, you can shut down Twitter or not interact with it, not look at that stuff. Mm. But to this day, there are people who are critiquing. And that idea, oh, you could have sat down and talked to them, mm. that actually kind of boils my blood because it reveals absolutely no understanding of what this is. And if we talk about any narcissistic relationship this way, the number of people who say, well, why don't you just reach out and sit with them? I say, you're sending them into a tiger's cage. What are you doing? No, 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 no. Nobody's sitting and talking about this. And yeah. so that sort of one size fits all. That kind of mediated response yeah. might work with some folks, not in this. And I think the unwillingness to recognize that is when we think of people who are going through this in their day-to-day relationships, you can see why it is so difficult for people to get out. Yeah. Cult or marriage no, or family or any of it. And when you really upscale hard. these abusive relationships to like pl- entire political parties, it is, it is mm-hmm. frightening. Mm-hmm. Oh, absolutely. You know? But I think all of these things that we're talking about is why I've become so obsessed with this topic. Yeah, yeah. You know, yeah. why I'm making mm-hmm. this film right mm-hmm. now yeah. ab- about narcissism. Talk to us about that film. Yeah, 2017 when I realized this guy's a narcissist. Yeah. That was my, the obsession began. But then I realized if we don't talk about the patterns, Mm -hmm. we're just going to get lost in the narcissistic porn, so to speak. So, you know, the film is called Empathy Not Included. Mm -hmm. It'll probably come out at the beginning of next year. Okay. Talk to many experts, you included. Thank you. Talk to many victims. Mm -hmm. We're also talking to self-confessed narcissists, Mm -hmm. which is absolutely fascinating. And what we're also looking at is narcissistic abuse at different scales, from romantic to family to mm-hmm. corporate to, to churches to, to cults, all the way up to the political level. We don't mm-hmm. go after any political parties. We want to just look at the pattern of sure. how these Absolutely. things work at that level. And I believe what we're creating is something that will be very palatable, very powerful. Great. And people will want to hopefully study more. After they see something like this, I hope they'll dive even more deeply into your work or maybe discover your work. There's a lot of amazing stuff out there right now about narcissism, about trauma bonding, Mm -hmm. about betrayal trauma. There's Mm -hmm. wonderful resources now. Mm -hmm. But I do agree. I I don't like the fact that sometimes clinicians are sort of anti-pathologizing things, people need to understand what they're looking at. Well, they need to understand. You don't even have to pathologize it. I say you have to You have to understand the fundamentals of narcissism. It's rigid. It's inflexible. It doesn't change. You know, Daniel Shaw, whose work in this field, probably the person I, whose work I admire, living person whose work I admire the most, he talks about this loss of intersubjectivity, that there's no space for anyone's reality except theirs. Yeah. So I always view it as like sort of like the big fish eats the small fish or, you know, sort of the, the amoeba sort of overtakes the, and that's it. You're in the yeah. amoeba system yeah. now. And so the real work becomes for a person who survives one of these experiences is to give themselves to become a differentiated whole, to become something or someone separate yeah. from this system. So what about you, though? What steps have you, Mark, personally as a survivor, taken to heal yeah, from this look, experience? Yeah, look, I threw everything out. Uh-huh. I also, there was a little moment I threw psychology out as well. I just mm, threw I everything out. I understand. And I went to, you know, Bonnie and I went to Portugal and we went to sit at the ocean, just stare mm-hmm. at the ocean. Mm-hmm. I had no idea who I was. Mm-hmm. I wasn't entirely sure what goodness was, but I knew that the battle I just done, I thought that was good. But I had no real deep connection to something inside of me until I sat at the ocean for a long time. Mm -hmm. And one day, I don't know what happened, I just felt something inside of myself, Mm -hmm. something wonderful and beautiful. And I said, oh, that's it. That's the real me Mm -hmm. that has been obscured for all these years. Mm -hmm. So I am in a much better place than I have been before. I find, interestingly enough, working on this film Mm -hmm. about narcissism is not traumatizing. Oh, that's wonderful. It's actually helping me. And actually everybody on the team who's involved, it's helping them. Mm-hmm. And every single crew member we have has a story of oh, their yeah. own. I'm sure. And every time they listen to an expert, they're like, oh my God, mm-hmm. I know what they're talking mm-hmm. about. So mm-hmm. it's been very healing. Honestly, I can tell people that there is, you know, life after narcissistic abuse. There is. And I don't know 
how can I say this? I think I'm stronger than I've ever been in my life. Mm. Maybe this is what was required. Maybe. I don't know. Mm-mm. Yeah, I, mean, I, I don't disagree. I think every journey of narcissistic abuse is a hero, heroine, yes. hero person's journey yeah. in the sense that it is the, it's the slaying the demons. It's being called to adventure and then facing the existential crisis and then having the fellow travelers that come along, the friends, the supporters, the therapists, the people who are there at your side, and then returning transform. And that's the story I hope for every survivor is that they recognize that they can, that we all have demons. It's only the narcissist that become the demons. Yeah. And I think that the, everyone else is slaying these demons. And even the narcissistic people, I still hold that there are unicorns there where they don't have to become the demon, that they could actually no. bring themselves from the edge, but it's hard work. You've talked to self professed nar- yeah. narcissistic folks. Yeah. But I do think that heroic journey that exists in everyone yeah. is really the, the story of narcissistic abuse. And I think I you never look th- at the world the same way. That moment of clarity you had in Portugal, mm-hmm. it's a moment. It's a mm-hmm. moment that if survivors can g- on, like sort of let that process unfold, let themselves face down that pain for you. It even culminated in a suicidal crisis. Yeah. This is not small pain. This is no, big pain. No. But then come back wholly to yourself, separate from any system, that if you're going to look for goodness, the goodness was there all along. Well, that was the thing that had to happen. I had to let go of looking anywhere else for the answers. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yes. And because yeah. there was kind of this abdication of my own sense of self yep. that I had to get over. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And by throwing everything out, temporarily. And even when I threw everything out, I was like, I know this isn't forever. I have a feeling this isn't forever. Mm -hmm. But stopping to look outside for the answers was so amazing Mm -hmm. because finally I could turn inside. And now I don't look at other people as though they have the answers. I look at people as like, oh, that's an interesting perspective. Let me feel what that feels like. You know, all the experts that I'm, that yep. I'm, that I'm talking to, I listen and I go, that resonates, that doesn't resonate. Yep. Okay, that's fine. And that's fine. But that idea that you can hold space for them, they can hold space for you, that a narcissistic person can hold space for your perspective, but two healthy people, even if you don't agree, you can sit there and hear that perspective and still know your core inside is solid. Unfortunately, that's not how a lot of people were raised no. as children to become yeah. their own, their sort of own people. For me in this podcast, something that's so essential to this is to to, again, depathologize the survivors who are, whether it's a story of just one person's story of their marriage, well, why did you stay so long? Why didn't you leave? To the story of getting into a cult, to the story of people giving people money, whatever it may be. Well, why did you do that? Mm. Yours went beyond that. People mm. were unkind to you. I would argue cruel to you. Mm-hmm. How did that impact your healing and how have you coped with that? That was very hard. Mm -hmm. In Mm -hmm. fact, sometimes it was an additional betrayal in some ways. It was incredibly cruel and it did set me back quite a bit. Mm -hmm. I got pretty messed up. Mm -hmm. I had to go off social media for a while. You know, some some of it has begun to make more sense to me in the last year because I look at how vengeful people are on social media. Yeah. And I'm beginning to see that it's sort of like maybe they haven't dealt with their shadow or something Mm. and they're just projecting a whole bunch of their own stuff everywhere. But I'm still proud of what we did. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I don't care what they say in terms of that because we did what we did. I'm proud Mm -hmm. of it. Mm -hmm. Does it hurt when they ridicule us? A little bit still. Yeah, of course. But what's helped me, weirdly enough, is as I'm studying narcissism and narcissistic abuse, I realize that pretty much everybody's in some kind of relationship of abuse and they may not realize it. Correct. That's exactly right. And that weirdly freed me because I'm Mm -hmm. like, oh, so you don't see it. Mm -hmm. So you're shitting on me because Mm -hmm. you see it in me, but you can't see it in you. That's right. Okay. Mm -hmm. Well, I hope it doesn't go as badly for you as it did for me, Mm -hmm. but you know, Mm -hmm. what can I say? Correct. Correct. And I think that you have that big stew of narcissism enablers and people who are in their own situations, but don't want to see it. So it's much easier to shame, blame, and pathologize the messenger, which would be someone like you, than to look at what is happening in their life. And you, at some level, you can empathize with that. Until you were ready to hear it, you weren't ready to hear it. Well, the other problem is people like me, I'm not the only one, but people like me are saying monsters are real. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Those stories of Dracula, they're real. 
And people mm-hmm. do not like that. No, no, they do. And people don't like knowing it's not a just world. People don't like the idea that there are monsters amongst us. People don't like that there's not always happy endings. And that's a lot. We were raised on this stuff. So I really feel that the work in narcissism is a dismantling of every religious teaching, every myth, and frankly, every fairy tale ever told, and having to look at these things through a very different eye. So do you want to add anything else, Mark? Because... I just think, honestly, I think that the work you're doing is so important. Thank you. People must understand how this works. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they They do. They cannot keep their heads buried under the sand. Mm -hmm. The world is full of these people, and they're in very powerful positions. Very powerful positions, which might explain why I've always had such trouble. I always said this should really be in K-12 curriculum. It should. Because you want to get this early, the pushback I've always gotten. This is too dark for that age, for anyone under 18. I said, great, because this is when kids start dating. We know that there's relationships violence when people are in their teens they may yeah. be dealing with narcissistic parents and so it, it feels as though you're you're to talk about narcissism to me is the ultimate anti-authoritarian and uh, ultimate yes. sort of anti-oppressive yes. message and I think in that way it's you got to keep finding the back doors to sneak and, through and to refuse to talk about it is serving somebody and people need absolutely. to understand that absolutely it does serve someone and I think I started this relationally like really working with people in their individual relationships but to ignore the societal piece of it any time a world event happens that involves sort of a narcissistic theme every client I work with my phone blows up yes. they're saying I'm unsettled of course you're unsettled yeah. the world is paralleling yeah. your relationship and your wounds right now yeah. so it means everything's right where it needs yeah, to be we should be disturbed at these mm-hmm. things we we're seeing we have a conscience yeah. we have mm-hmm. a heart we should yeah. be disturbed yeah well thanks for bringing back empathy in your <laughs> special way making empathy <laughs> healthy and sexy again I appreciate that that is what we're doing Mark. that is what we're doing so thank you again where can people find you is there anything you want to share about how because I personally can't wait to see this film yeah. and let the world know. I have my website. I'm on Instagram and uh-huh. starting TikTok and Facebook. You know, Great. it's always just Mark Vicente wherever I am. And um, yeah, people can reach out to me on, on social media. Great. Well, thank you again, Mark, for this incredible conversation. Many of us watched The Vow and were horrified by the stories of sexual abuse, of power, control, and manipulation. This conversation with Mark reminds us that the oppressive and manipulative mind games used in a cult may be at a larger scale, but they're no different than what happens in any narcissistic relationship. Mark's relationship with Nexium started from a place of feeling understood, feeling seen, and believing in the organization and the leaders. As time went on, the lack of empathy, the grandiosity, the gaslighting, the projection, blame shifting, isolation, and techniques like mentally and physically exhausting people and making them jump through hoops, uh, while it may be more organized than what happens in a family or a relationship, it's all the same. Many people saw the vow as the story of a cult. I simply saw it as one more story of a narcissistic relationship. So here are some takeaways from my conversation with Mark. First, every narcissistic relationship is sort of a cult. A cult of two, maybe, but a cult. Grooming, indoctrination, having reality stolen, becoming isolated, manipulated, and being told that the relationship is a special place that no one else will understand, that's a cult. When we think of it that way, we are reminded that all of us are vulnerable to this kind of manipulation. If you are witnessing abuse in a family or a workplace system or any other kind of system, be a support, speak up, and as Mark said, make it your business. Many times abuse happens because other people stay silent. If it doesn't feel right, reach in and protect others when you can. Do so when it feels safe, but find a way to do so. If you suspect someone may be in a narcissistically abusive relationship, don't just roll up and say, hey, I think that person is a narcissist. Instead, when you approach them, focus on patterns. When a person is in one of these relationships, they often care about or love the other person. They may still be in denial, 
and it can be devastating for them to recognize that this relationship is abusive, even if they are aware that it doesn't feel good. Focusing on patterns rather than simply labeling a person can help you communicate with somebody else about it, and it may leave that other person feeling less defensive. A big thank you to our executive producers, Jada Pinkett Smith, Fallon Jethro, Ellen Rakuten, and Dr. Romani Dravasala. And thank you to our producer, Matthew Jones, associate producer, Mara De La Rosa, and consultant, Kelly Ebeling. And finally, thank you to our editors and sound engineers, Devin Donahue and Calvin Bailiff. 